Still Sharon, still Sharon. Hey y'all, today I'll be presenting autistic differences in interpreting scopal ambiguities, a pilot study I conducted for a semantics course I am taking this semester. I'm Nicholas Hubble, let's get started. So previous literature investigating scope ambiguity differences in autistic people assumes some deficit in autistic language. And this led me to ask, well, what could I find? with a study that doesn't assume autistic people are inherently lacking and operating on the same level as children. I think we might find some differences maybe. So for the theoretical background, some studies on ambiguous scope of negation and autism are hard to find. I found one only. It is a Novak and colleagues study from 2007, which found that autistic participants rejected a not every interpretation, that is a partial negation reading, for French every not type sentences, even when presented with a two out of three context, either in a story or a picture. And their reasoning for autistic difference seems sound, that pragmatic difficulties associated with autism, they say, they may impact the ability to use context to establish meaning. However, the study also had lots of methodological and theoretical concerns wrapped up into it. So they compared young children to autistic teens to non-autistic young adults, and they calculated the mental age of the autistic participants, but not anyone else. And then the autistic participants also had relatively low IQ scores, which are usually taken to indicate more than just autism, like some additional language impairment in more current studies, but those researchers did not separate, separate those things out the way that more current studies tend to do. So there have been other studies, but those have investigated similar phenomena in other non-autistic populations. So Notley, Zhao, and Crane looked into negation conjunction scope ambiguities with Chinese Mandarin-speaking children, and Mussolino and colleagues asked English speaking children, how they interpret negation quantifier scope ambiguities. So the purpose of this study then is to investigate autistic differences in interpreting scopal ambiguities under the assumption that the well-established differences in pragmatic ability may result in differences in extracting meaning from context. And of course, under the assumption that these are differences and not deficits. For the methods, I ended up getting 125 participants' responses, which was pretty impressive. 25 of them were for sure autistic, 25 said that they may be autistic, but they were not sure, and then 75 were non-autistic. The method was to survey autists for judgments of sentences with ambiguity in the scope of negation, quantifiers, and conjunction elements, and so for those types of ambiguities specifically were negation quantifier scope ambiguities, which is not every and every not type of sentences, and then universal existential quantifier scope ambiguities, which are some every, every some type of sentences, and then negation conjunction scope ambiguities, which are the not both and not and type sentences, which I will get into some examples of those types now. So the materials were a Google Forms survey, which first asked general demographic questions about age, gender, autism, and language ability. And the scope ambiguity sentences for the questions mirrored items used in previous studies, as well as some examples from an advanced formal syntax lecture on scopal ambiguities by our department's very own Dr. Joey Saba, and some that I made up. So some examples of those are provided for negation quantifier scope ambiguity. The sentences using the universal quantifier where every horse did not jump over the fence. All the children are not in the pool. And for the existential quantifier, I had one example that I came up with and it was Spider-Man didn't deliver some pizzas. For the negation conjunction sentences, those were along the lines of the elephant didn't eat both the carrot and the pepper, 
And then for universal existential quantifier scope ambiguity, I used every prize was won by some dog and some pirate is holding every fishing rod. After the experimental questions, participants then answered some final demographic questions about language, which were, is English your first language? What languages do you speak? And have you taken any formal linguistics courses? And these were asked at the end to avoid um, tipping participants off to the language questions, the nature of them, even though it was probably pretty obvious once they got started with the experimental questions that it was about language. So the results for the demographic questions, the distributions, most of the participants were in the 18 to 29 range, which makes sense since most of my participants were friends around my age or Reddit users. And then for gender, it was a pretty even split between the binary genders and a decent amount of non-binary participants with a few participants marking unknown question mark or blank for genders. So I collapsed those all into unknown. For the autism self-report results, the majority of participants were not autistic as noted earlier. And of the 20% that answered yes, they were autistic, three-fourths of them, 16% of the participants are professionally diagnosed autists, and one-fourth of them, 4% of the total participants were self-diagnosed. I then asked whether participants' first language was English with these responses. Most of the participants, 69%, had an English L1, with 31% saying in some way or another that English was learned later for them. And then this beautiful pie shows the wide variation of languages spoken by participants. Um, the largest slice only spoke English with some decent sized chunks of English, French, English, German, and English, Spanish bilinguals. And much like in the real world, the majority of the participants were multilingual to some degree. And on this slide is the full list of participant languages, which I think it would be interesting to look at if there are any relationships between languages known and the results of the study. Man, fuck. Uh, sweet fucking Jesus. Just trying to get it done. Please. Okay. Hi, y'all. Today I'll be presenting Autistic Differences in Interpreting Scopal Ambiguities, a pilot study I've conducted for a semantics course I'm taking this semester. I'm Nicholas Hobble, let's get into it. So previous literature investigating scope ambiguity differences in autistic people assumes some deficit in autistic languages. And this led me to ask myself, what can I find with a study that does not assume autistic people are inherently lacking and operating on the same level as children? Uh, and I think we might find some differences, maybe. For the theoretical background for this little pilot study, other studies on Scopus, Scopus, Jesus McChrist, try it again. Hi y'all, today I'll be presenting autistic differences in interpreting scopal ambiguities a pilot study I've conducted for a semantics course I'm taking this semester. I'm Nicholas Howell, let's get started. So previous literature investigating scope ambiguity differences in autistic people assumes some deficit in autistic language. And this led me to ask myself, what could I find with a study that does not assume autistic people are inherently lacking and operating at the same level as children? <laughs> 
And I think we might find some differences. So for the theoretical background here, studies on ambiguous scope of negation and autism are limited. I found one study, a Novak and colleagues study from 2007, which found that autistic participants reject a not every interpretation or a partial negation reading for French every not type sentences, even when presented with a two out of three context via a picture or a story. And their reasoning for autistic difference seems sound. Uh, they cite pragmatic difficulties associated with autism that may impact the ability to use context to establish meaning. However, this study had lots of methodological and theoretical concerns wrapped up into it. And so they compared young children to autistic teens to non-autistic adults, so not an even comparison. They calculated the mental age of the autistic participants, but not anyone else. And then the autistic participants also had pretty low IQ scores, which usually indicates more than just autism, like some additional language impairment. And those researcher, researchers did not separate those things out the way that more current studies tend to. Other studies have investigated similar phenomena, but in other non-autistic populations. So Notley, Zhao, and Crane looked into negation conjunction scope ambiguities with Chinese Mandarin-speaking children, and Mussolino and colleagues asked English-speaking children how they interpret negation quantifier scope ambiguities. So the purpose of this study then is to investigate autistic differences in interpreting scopal ambiguities under the assumption that the well-established differences in pragmatic ability may result in differences in extracting meaning from context. And of course, under the assumption that these are differences and not deficits. For the methods, I ended up getting 125 responses. 25 participants were for sure autistic 25 said they may be autistic, but they were not sure, and 75 were non-autistic. The method was to survey autists and non-autists for judgments of sentences with ambiguity in the scope of negation, quantifier, and conjunction elements. And so these were negation quantifier scope ambiguity, which is a not every every not type of sentence, universal existential quantifier scope ambiguity, which is a sum every or every sum type of sentence and negation conjunction scope ambiguities. And those are not both or not and kind of sentences. So the materials were a Google form survey, which first asked general demographic questions about age, gender, autism, and language ability. And then the scope ambiguity sentences for the questions mirrored items used in previous studies, as well as some examples from an advanced formal syntax lecture on scopal ambiguities by our department's very own Dr. Joey Saba, and some other ones that I made up. So some examples of those are provided for negation quantifier scope ambiguity. The sentences using the universal quantifiers are every horse did not jump over the fence, and all the children are not in the pool. And then for the existential quantifier, I had one example, and that was Spider-Man didn't deliver some pizzas. For the negation conjunction sentences, those were along the lines of the elephant didn't eat both the carrot and the pepper. And then for universal existential quantifier scope ambiguity, I used every prize was won by some dog and some pirate is holding every fishing rod. After the experimental questions, then participants answered some final demographic questions about language, which were, is English your first language? What languages do you speak? And how, or not how, have you studied any formal linguistics? And these were asked at the end to avoid tipping participants off to the, to the language nature of the questions, even though it was probably pretty obvious from the experimental questions that it was about language. I just prefer to do this setup so they don't have that early mindset of looking at language things. 
So the results for the demographic questions, the distributions looked like this. Most of the participants were in the 18 to 29 age range, which makes sense since most of the participants were either friends around my age or Reddit users. And I think the graph on the left is pretty much the distribution of Reddit users by age. And then for gender, there was a pretty even split between the binary genders and a decent amount of non-binary participants with a few participants marking unknown, question mark, or blank as well. So I just collapsed those into unknown. For the autism self-report results, the majority of participants were not autistic, as noted earlier. And of the 20% that answered, yes, they are autistic, three-fourths of them, 16% of the total participants, are professionally diagnosed autists, and one-fourth of them, 4% of the total participants, were self-diagnosed. I then asked whether English was participants' first language. With these responses, most of the participants, 69%, had an English L1 with 31% saying in some way or another that English was learned later for them. And then this beautiful pie shows the wide variation of languages spoken by participants. The largest slice only spoke English, with some decent sized chunks of English French, English German, and English Spanish bilinguals. And so much like in the real world, the majority of the participants were multilingual to some degree, as shown by all of the colors that are not that purple in the graph. And then this is the list, the full list of participant languages, which it would be interesting and way beyond the scope of this study to see what patterns emerge um, among bilinguals of different language families. But again, way beyond the scope of this one. So this pie shows the distribution of participant languages by number of languages shown. And the bar graph on the right shows that 80% of the autistic participants are multilingual, if you total up the pink sections. The final demographic question asked participants if they had studied any formal linguistics, and the majority of participants had not. And further, of interest for this study, the majority of the autistic participants had not taken any formal linguistics shown by the pink chunk in the no column up here. So then the first set of results from the negation quantifier scope ambiguity questions are in, most broadly, including a picture as I did in sentences two and three, decreased ambiguity. There were less participants that selected that the sentence was ambiguous and needed more context when there was a picture given. Sentence two, every horse did not jump over the fence, is the classic example cited across the literature, but the predicted pattern does not materialize here. And specifically, the non-autistic group and the autistic group have basically identical responses for number two. As an interesting note, the neurotypical respondents judge three, all children are not in the pool as more ambiguous or as ambiguous in meaning more than the possibly and definitely autistic people. Then here we have sentences four and six. Four is the teacher didn't buy every orange and Spider-Man didn't deliver some pizzas. So both four and six had no accompanying picture context, but the autist did not seem to prefer a total negation interpretation where the universal quantifier takes scope over negation in either of those que questions. Um, on the contrary, more of the neurotypical respondents seem to prefer a total negation reading for six. In this one, we have sentences seven, not all the cows are black, and eight, all Americans are not rich. And interestingly, the autistic group found seven to be ambiguous slightly more than their non-autistic counterparts, even with the context provided. 
comparing only the more definitive groups for eight, there doesn't seem to be a large difference in interpretation preferences, but the possibly autistic people do seem to trend toward preferring a total negation reading when no context is given. The results from the questions with universal existential quantifier scope ambiguities by autism are shown here, where we have nine, every prize was won by some dog, and some pirate is holding every fishing rod. The graph on the left shows that autists and maybe autists called this sentence ambiguous more than neurotypical participants, suggesting that autists may recognize the scopal ambiguity when no context is present, or just that they demand more context. If the universal quantifier always takes scope over other elements, as predicted by previous literature, we should expect a preference for pair list readings for autists when it is universal and existential quantifier, even when the context suggests otherwise. But that is not the pattern that I found. With and without context, autists demonstrated no such preference for a pair list reading for universal existential quantifier scope ambiguity. For sentences containing negation conjunction scope ambiguities when context is provided, as in five, autists showed no preference for a total negation. In fact, none of the autistic participants interpreted five as having total negation in which the elephant ate nothing. But without context, though, as in 11, the frog didn't jump over the log and pond, which didn't have a picture, autists did follow a slight trend in the prediction, predicted direction where a negation element takes scope over the conjunction element, leading to a total negation reading. But only slightly, only a slight trend. So then the predicted patterns did not pan out anywhere in this study. If anything, I found opposite patterns from what has been found in previous literature that at best assumes autistic deficiency and at worst infantilizes autistic adults. Neurotypicals in this study preferred a total negation interpretation despite conflicting context information more than autistic participants and gave an ambiguous judgment despite the provided context for three. Autists in this study did not seem to prefer a total negation interpretation, despite conflicting context information, which is in contrast to the previous literature with a very similar population, the Novak 2007 study. Additionally, autists judge sentence with no picture context as ambiguous more often than neurotypicals, though the cow sentence number seven was judged as ambiguous despite the provided context. So it's not clear if these slight differences add up to anything theoretically meaningful, though. For each sentence where the patterns go one way, it seems there is another where the patterns go the other way. Age and gender didn't really have any solid overarching patterns for the data, but some interesting small patterns emerged. So people who put unknown for gender were the most decisive. That is, they rarely marked a sentence as ambiguous, needing more context, compared to people who gave a more definitive answer for gender. And also, younger participants preferred a total negation interpretation for negation quantifier ambiguous sentences, but only those that had the universal quantifiers, which means Spider-Man got a partial negation reading even with no context. For the language variables, there were really no differences overall between participants whose native language was English and those who were non-native English speakers, but only the native speakers, five of them, said that number seven, not all the cows, not all cows are black was ambiguous. And then the person who said that they speak English at the same level as their first language marked sentences as ambiguous most often. And the people who put that they reached C2 level and English was better than their mother tongue 
um, seem to prefer total negation and pair list reading, sometimes despite context. The number of languages seemed to show a slight pattern, which was the more languages that a participant knew, the more likely they were to give an ambiguous judgment, even with context provided. And then the less languages a participant knew, it seemed they patterned like autists in the previous literature, which by that I mean they preferred um, total negation readings and pair list readings. Exposure to formal linguistics, though, did not appear to account for the patterns in responses any more than autisticity. Um, there were really no striking differences between the groups, those who had any exposure to linguistics, those who had studied linguistics, and those who hadn't at all. It was pretty much all the same. Some of the limitations of this study, and there were a few, included um, that there was no real measurement of autisticity, just a self-report, yes, no, maybe question, and whether self or professionally diagnosed. Uh, there was also no real measurement of language ability, and no one ended up re self-reporting language difficulties either, which I guess could have been expected. Uh, most of the responses were from people on Reddit, which one needs decent language ability to do regularly. So whether specific language impairment is the cause of the reported differences in the previous literature remains a theoretically interesting area of further study. This study also had a rather limited scope. Um, only had 25 autists and with no formal measure of autisticity. Only 11 questions were used with pseudo random accompanying context, like whether it had a picture or not, and unbalanced types of scopal ambiguity. And the survey des design itself had some further limitations besides just number and balance. Um, I forgot to mark all the questions as required until I had already gotten most of my responses. So I got quite a few blanks um, for different questions. Not a large amount or a majority in any case, always just a few, but still. Um, lastly, though, the analysis was lacking because I didn't do any major statistics or formal analysis, really. I just was comparing numbers and proportions to look at trends, patterns. Uh, which seems sufficient for this uh, pilot study, but some formal statistical analysis would definitely need to be conducted for future iterations of this study. And speaking of future directions, of course, psychological measures of autisticity and language ability would be able to more clearly differentiate the populations of autists and neurotypical participants. And this might also um, require or benefit from the specific recruitment of participants with known specific language difficulties. Um, this type of study could also benefit from a more controlled presentation of stimuli, uh, specifically um, using a new screen for each question, as well as using equally balanced scopal ambiguities and examples with and without pictures for each type of scopal ambiguity and presenting those questions a little more randomly. And then future researchers could also use videos or GIFs as sentence context, given that um, still frame pictures can sometimes remain ambiguous as to the processes that led to the state depicted in the picture. And then I also, like I said on the last slide, I didn't do any super formal statistic analysis. Um, just a basic comparison of numbers and proportions. So taking this study any further would certainly necessitate having those statsy skills and an analysis of variance to determine whether any of the patterns found were significant and how much each factor um, played into the results. <laughs>
So in conclusion, previous literature has pointed to a possible difference in autistic preferences for interpreting sentences with scopal ambiguities. And these studies have investigated two main types of scope ambiguities. Uh, those are negation quantifier scopal ambiguity and negation conjunction scopal ambiguities. I included in this study universal existential quantifier scope ambiguities just well, on the recommendation of my classmates and colleagues, and also to get a slightly more well-rounded um, look at different scopal ambiguities and how they relate to autism. None of the patterns found in the previous studies were found here though. So it is still unclear if the model or approach to autistic linguistics makes a difference. That is um, whether one uses a deficit model or a difference model of linguistic variation. And it also remains unclear if there were enough questions for the broader patterns to even emerge. And we still don't know if autists with reported difficulties in learning or acquiring language would behave any differently for these same questions. But the divergence from previous patterns alone that I found here merits further investigation into this population and how they might resolve scopal ambiguities differently if they do. And there's my references. That's all I've got. Thank you for watching. If you have comments or questions, leave them in the comments below. I think that's all I got. Thank you for watching. I'm signing off. Have a good summer.